organization led by outdoor learning charity, the Enos Crook Trust, is for teachers looking for guidance and inspiration in taking the curriculum outside. It offers suggestions for using school grounds and local green spaces, an overview of some of the health and safety and risk assessment considerations needed. Ideas on taking different areas areas of the curriculum outside and some particular solutions to the most commonly encountered barriers. This session will be with Emily Crawley and presented by Alison Cross, Liz McKenzie and Susie Granger. Um, hi, welcome everybody. Helena, would you like to put the slides up? Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Helena. So, hello and thank you for joining uh, us for this session. I just want to check you're in the right place. This session is for primary school teachers looking for guidance and inspiration in taking the curriculum outside. We're going to tell you a bit about why you might like to consider including some outdoor learning in your planning in terms of the benefits that it can bring and give you some advice and signpost some resources to help you make we would love for you to end this session with some ideas and confidence to get your class outdoors and we'll be answering any questions you may have. So if you've got any questions, um, put them in the box on the live stream website or Slido um, any point through the session and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. So our speakers today are Alison Cross, the Outdoor Learning Officer for the Ernest Cook Trust, who's based at the Pendle Hill Landscape Partnership in Lancashire. Alison works on school grounds, as well as taking school groups out for sessions at local green, green spaces and beyond. We also have Liz McKenzie on our panel, who's the school's programme lead for the Ernest Cook Trust. She manages our school's programme and is going to give you a bit more insight into the research, risk assessment and evidencing learning side of things. Helena Shivji is ECT's graduate trainee and she is in charge of the tech today. Uh, so she'll be putting your questions to the panel later. Do send over any thoughts you have. My name's Emily Crawley and I'm the Head of Learning at the Ernest Cook Trust. Um, we are an educational tra uh, charity and we focus on outdoor learning. The charity owns uh, land holdings in five counties and we work with organisations in two more. Our estates are made up largely of woodland and farmland and we use these landscapes to inspire young people to achieve better educational and life outcomes by learning from the land. ECT is also a grant giving organisation and all of our funding goes towards environmentally focused education projects. So we've been working with schools for over 15 years and we recognise that a child's formative years have an enormous impact on their lifelong environmental concern and nature connectedness. Our schools programme aims to build positive relationships between young people and green spaces. This enables children to benefit from the widely reported psychological impacts of time outdoors and also increases the likelihood of future pro-environmental behaviour. Our approach with schools is all about understanding the school's priorities and concerns and designing outdoor learning projects and sessions that meet these needs. This means that the support and in interventions that we, we offer are often likely to have multiple aims. So we're looking at national curriculum links, uh, behaviour and attitude to learning improvements or nurturing well-being alongside nature connectedness. So by making outdoor learning a positive experience from a young age and a tool which schools see the benefit of, we have an opportunity to enhance academic attainment, well-being and environmental engagement. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Liz, who will talk a bit about the research into outdoor learning. OK, so we've heard a lot about people reconnecting with the outdoors during periods of lockdown due to COVID-19. There's been a steady flow of articles on TV, on the internet and in newspapers and magazines reporting on the benefits of time spent in nature. 
And empirical research is backing up anecdotal evidence and something that many people just inherently know, that being outdoors is good for us. These benefits are summed up beautifully in these infographics from the US-based Children and Nature Network, which not only present the findings in an eye-catching manner, but also lists substantive research that supports the claims, from respective publications such as the Journal for Environmental Psychology, the Journal of Child and Adolescent Behaviour, Journal of Environmental Education, Nature, and the Journal of Happiness Studies. So we see that learning in nature can support improved relationship skills and reduce anger and aggression in children. Exploration and discovery through outdoor experiences can promote an increased enthusiasm for learning and greater engagement with learning. Nature-based learning is associated with greater levels of impulse control and less disruptive behaviour. Time outdoors in nature contributes to children's um, care for nature while supporting their healthy development, better social skills, enhanced health, increased self-esteem, improved academic attainment, stronger emotional connections to people in nature, and pro-environmental behaviours. In the UK, the Institute for Outdoor Learning puts learning in the outdoors at the core of the process of developing care for the global environment. It seems that if we want the children and young people attending the summit this week to grow up to take an active part in combating climate change, one of the best things that we can do for them as teachers is to engage in outdoor learning. So if it is so clear cut, why aren't we all providing outdoor learning on a daily basis? Of course, there are all manner of answers to this question, but one very basic stumbling block can be a lack of understanding of what outdoor learning actually is, or whether an activity you have planned actually is outdoor learning. That might sound a bit silly, but the IOL have identified over 80,000 ways to describe learning activities that take place outdoors in terms of what sort of activity is involved, who it's delivered to, where it takes place, and what the intended outcome is. Every one of these can legitimately be said to be a way of describing outdoor learning. It is therefore easier to think of the term outdoor learning as an umbrella term for facilitated approaches to individual social and environmental learning that takes place predominantly through activities and experiences in the outdoors. Meanwhile, we can say that outdoor learning happens when knowledge, skills, attitudes or behaviours change as a result of direct engagement with the outdoor environment. It's important for children to have opportunities to take part in experiences across the spectrum of outdoor learning, from self-directed free play through curriculum-based activities to outdoor sport and adventure. We don't expect you to provide all that yourself. Today, we're going to be talking about the sort of outdoor learning that can be described as curriculum-based activities and conservation tasks on school grounds or in nearby green spaces that aim to promote academic achievement personal and social development and environmental awareness. However, I would also just like to add in here, here a comment about Forest School. Forest School is a wonderful form of outdoor learning centered on children's self-initiated activity, which has myriad benefits for both the participants and the proponents. Forest School is also something that is becoming more and more familiar to teachers, children and parents. This is of course brilliant, but we need to be careful here in the use of language. It must be remembered that forest school is an ethos, not a place. There is a set of key principles that must be adhered to, and the delivery should be by a qualified forest school leader trained at level three. We should not use the term forest school to refer to adult directed curriculum based activities, wherever they might be undertaken, even in the center of a forest. Alison, would you like to talk a little bit more about that very subject? Where should these um, activities be undertaken? So you now know a bit more about the importance of outdoor learning, but where are you going to carry out your outdoor learning? So if you have a school grounds and an outdoor space that is a bit more than tarmac and a concrete playground, you should be able to use this space to teach a wide range of subjects and national curriculum activities. The area might need a bit of TLC or maybe some additional resources or have a few creations of more nature friendly spaces and some more engaging, friendly, inviting areas for your participants. If you think you need to carry out some of these school grounds improvements for teaching and for the wildlife, then here is a list of a few organisations that can help you. I've written them down here, so do feel free to pause or make note of what these are. Your local wildlife trust charity is always worth speaking to first. When you get in touch, do ask for the school grounds officer. I know this, I used to work with them and they're a brilliant team and a great asset and help to you. 
Now, these guys will hopefully be able to develop your outdoor space. They might even know about some funding applications that you can apply for. This will help save your ever shrinking school budgets. They might offer you some great ideas, some advice, and maybe some case studies as well from other local schools. Learning Through Landscapes have over 30 years of experience in supporting local schools in school grounds for play and for outdoor learning. So have a look on their website. They have lots of info and tools on how to develop outdoor education spaces, plus design suggestions as well. Policies, guidance and training, and more importantly, more funding avenues. There are also some other organisations and charities as well that offer similar offerings opportunities. Now if you don't have an outdoor space you might have to go and look up some other spaces. Oh just a quick note that if you did want to do some school ground improvements on Monday as part of the Youth Climate Summit there were three talks and they were by Sussex Wildlife Trust, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and Landscapes for the Future and they all talked about how you can get involved in more school ground improvements. So if you don't have an actual outdoor space within your school grounds, you could always use a public outdoor space that's near you. For example, you might want to use a local public park, a nature reserve, public footpath, or even a community woodland. However, it is always best to confirm and check you've got the landowner's permission. For example, if you're just going to use a public park, please get the permission first. It's kind to inform the council if you're going to plan to be there on a certain day. For example, if you're going to bring 30 children to do a woodland activity day, but the council are there cutting down some of the trees, it's not going to go well. Confirming your site might just involve filling in a short form, sending over a risk assessment and maybe some insurance documents. If you're going to use transport, public transport or your own minibus, do check where your parking location is going to be and that you've got permission for that as well. If you're going to go on the walk, do check that you can take your group past maybe a private house. A footpath might go past somebody's kitchen window. Do check with them that they don't mind the first children yapping and chatting as they walk past their private house. And do make sure you've got the landowner's permission to pass through it. For another example, walking through a field with 30 children during lambing season, it's not going to be a good idea. So always best to do a recce, a pre-visit, especially a few days beforehand. I'm going to show you a few examples now that I've used with schools and just how versatile outdoor spaces are. Here's a farmer's polytunnel. A farm very kindly offered it to me as a great afternoon session. We were looking at the plants inside and the pollinators that went with them. A farmer's field is a brilliant versatile space. As you can see in this photo, that's me in the woolly hat. And I am actually IDing that tree and we're identifying it. And then we're measuring its girth and working out how old it is. Farmer's field offers such a good variety of activities to do even in winter. Now, you might have a community site, for example, this community space has a gorgeous meadow, we got in touch, they said no one uses it on a Thursday, so off we went with a group of children and we did a lovely minibus hunting activity. As I've mentioned before, public footpaths offer a great opportunity just to get your school class out and exploring what's around them. So you might want to take them on any public footpath. But as I've said before, make sure you recce it, especially a few days beforehand, because the season, the weather obviously changes what the children might be able to see and a few of the health and safety aspects that you need to consider. And last but not least, one of my favourites. If you want to go adventurous, by all means, you can do, but you can always head to your local public park. So have a look around, see what habitats there are. Some parks are quite what I called clean. So, for example, I had to bring a lot of my own sticks to this park, but the kids really enjoy just exploring the variety of habitats and the mini beasts that live with them. And if you really want to go extreme exploring, head up maybe a local hill. This is my Pendle Hill in East Lancashire. And I took a group of community college students to the top. Obviously, the weather can change the higher up you get, especially in the fells. But the kids still had a brilliant time and we did explore a lot of the local area. I'm going to hand you over now back to Liz and I think she's going to talk about a few more top tips. Yes. What about the risks? Going back to that question, why aren't we all providing outdoor learning on a daily basis? One of the most frequently quoted reasons for not engaging in outdoor learning historically was that health and safety wouldn't allow it. 
Fortunately, great work has been done in recent years to dispel myths and the Health and Safety Executive itself has published guidance that not only recognises that learning outside the classroom helps to bring the curriculum to life, but it also helps pupils to de develop their risk awareness and prepares them for their future working lives. In addressing a Learning Outside the Classroom conference in 2009, the Chair of HSE stated, in reference to risk management, that those taking part in outdoor activities should be aware that in doing so they are exposing themselves to risk. But she went on to say that this is a good thing why? Because life itself is full of risks we cannot avoid. We all survive by learning how to deal with risk and helping young people experience risk and learn how to handle it is part of preparing them for adult life. Similarly, Peter Cornell of ROSPA, an organisation with the remit of preventing accidents, which you might think would give it the potential to be quite risk averse. In this quote from 2007, promotes children being given the opportunity to find out about things that can hurt them for themselves. He said, when children spend time in the great outdoors, getting muddy, getting wet, getting stung by nettles, they learn important lessons. What hurts, what is slippery, what you can trip over or fall from. He also questions our own perception of risk by asking, is it better for a child to break a wrist falling out of a tree or to get a repetitive strain wrist injury at a young age from using a computer? Because in fact, the mantra at Rosper is that we must try to make life as safe as necessary not as safe as possible. Finally, the DFE advised that risk assessment and risk management are tools to enable children to undertake activities safely and not prevent activities from taking place. And that what they brand as sensible risk management does not have to remove risk entirely. All that said, it doesn't mean that we don't need to be thinking about risks. In many, in many instances, when curriculum activities are being undertaken in the school grounds, those risks will be no greater than those involved in a normal PE lesson or break time play. However, when we venture off site or when we engage in more adventurous or challenging activities, such as the use of tools, for example, then a more extensive risk assessment will be required. The Outdoor Education Advisors Panel, OEAP, supports local authorities, schools and academy groups in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. It provides a forum for sharing and developing good practice and off site visits, outdoor learning and, outdoor and learning outside the classroom. You will almost certainly be familiar with them if you are your school's educational visits coordinator, and likely so if you've organised and led your own off-site visits. OEAP publishes guidance on all aspects of undertaking, undertaking educational visits and outdoor learning, from avoiding accidents to managing volunteers. Their national guidance on risk management, available online, promotes a simple two-stage risk management process. Identify the potential benefits to be gained from an activity, and any significant risks to those involved. Plan and implement measures to reduce these risks as low as reasonably practicable without losing the benefits. And use professional judgment to decide whether in order to gain those benefits, the remaining risks are acceptable. In addition to the risk management overview, further OEAP guidance provides practical advice for leaders and details of what to record and how in risk management. Both these documents reiterate that if existing generic documents cover everything, then there's no need to repeat anything. When it comes to risk benefit an analysis, Tim Gill's Nothing Ventures, Balancing Benefits and Risks in the Outdoors, published by the English Outdoor Council, clearly sets out the philosophy behind the process. And the Health and Safety Executive's myth-busting publication, School Trips and Outdoor Learning Activity, sets out both what staff should expect from schools and what the school, pupils and parents should expect from staff in relation to risk management. So once you've found a suitable outdoor space to work in, what might you do there? Alison. So once you've got your location sorted and you know your risks and you know what group you're going to take out into the great outdoors, as Liz says, what are you actually going to do? So the, the outdoors offers such a huge variety of uses and there's lots of national curriculum links and amazing variety of topics that 
you can use and they are all really adaptable to be outside. So I've just listed a few of the obvious national curriculum topics that you could take outside. Plants, rocks and soils, of course, you know, doing tree and plant identification, even looking at geology, you could look at the soil and do decomposition, kind of scientific investigations. I've made compost bins with children and we've watched how the food decays over time. It's been fascinating. Living things in their habitats, of course, really obvious to take outside. You could carry on mini beet hunting or looking at seasonal changes. And if you want to, it'd be brilliant if your pupils could carry out a conservation activity as well. Local geography is one of my favourites to do. And this involves looking at maps and compass work. It's really good if you could get an old map of your local school grounds or the area that you're in. And then you can look at its history and how it's changed over time. Studying the buildings and maybe even doing some kind of archaeology investigations. Those have gone down really well in the past with my kids. Last but not least is one of my favourites, is creativity. The outdoors offers such a huge variety of inspiration. I'll just talk about a few aspects in detail now. Now, you might have heard of an artist called Andy Goldsworthy. He is a brilliant land artist and he does lots of things with leaves and natural materials. So the bottom picture on the slide is a beautiful variety of bright coloured leaves in the middle and those darker leaves on the outside. With it being November, in the past, I've actually created with students our own land art firework displays with lots of brilliant bright coloured leaves and sticks to be rockets. They loved it. You could also collect natural materials and make some clay creations like the mini beasts in the top picture. I've even put clay on trees and we've made tree faces. And then the children have told me all about the different parts of their face. And they got really excited, especially when they were putting the biggest leaves on to be the giant ears. Great fun. Now, a great different activity is actually creating a mini beast agility course, or you can make a mini beast like kind of Glastonbury. So we've used music outside as a great chance of using sticks and stones to create your own guitars and drum kits. And last but not least would be my sensory exploring. Really good for early years. So making smelly cocktails, doing some texture exploring and just looking for the different colors in nature. Now you're probably brimming with ideas and getting all excited, but where on earth do you start? Well, don't worry, everyone's already done this for quite a few years. So here is a huge list of all the organizations and charities that do outdoor learning. If you click on any of these websites, you'll find lots of learning resources. So things like ID sheets, whole lesson plans, free resources for you to download and use. So don't worry about starting outdoor learning from scratch. Check out these websites, put in the theme, put in the age that you're going to be using outside, maybe a few keywords, and hopefully you will find out some lots more details here. Now, Liz has got some other additional top tips just for you to consider when you're next outdoors. So you've got a location sorted, whether on, on site or off, you've researched activities and you're ready to make a start. Here's a be kind to yourself guide to getting started based on advice from Juliet Robertson of Creative, Creative Star Learning. First of all, choose the topic area for your first outdoor session that you feel really confident in. That way you can concentrate on dealing with the unfamiliar aspects of the session and not worry about the content. Keep it simple, don't plan anything that requires intricate management while you and your children are getting used to the new mode of learning. However, do make a plan and make sure that any adults that will be with you know and understand your intentions. Think about whether you might use your TA, if you have one, differently from your normal practice in the classroom. Resting appropriately is so important for everyone in an outdoor session. You cannot fully engage in the freedom of outdoor learning if you're worried about getting wet or dirty. Invest in a good waterproof jacket and some waterproof trousers and discover the benefits of layers of clothing and stout boots. Once you're waterproofed, relax and be ready to sit on the ground on an old log or whatever and be able to get down to the children's level and involved in their learning or their play when you're invited. Encourage adult helpers to do the same. Seeing you relaxed in the outdoor environment will help the more timid and those that are afraid of the consequences of getting dirty to relax themselves. Remember, though, it may be necessary to remind parents of the purposes of wellies and waterproofs to enable the wearer to go out in the wet. These things will get both wet and muddy when engagement with the outdoors is not constrained by the weather. 
In slide within this presentation, you'll see photographs of happy children wrapped up in waterproof jackets and trousers or racks of welly boots that have been provided to disadvantaged schools through the Ennis Cook Trust Outdoor Essentials grant stream. We plan to make these grants available again in 2021. So if you are working in an area of high deprivation, please do keep out an eye out and consider applying. You may be awarded £500 to help you kit out your children with wellies and waterproofs to begin or continue their outdoor learning journey in comfort. Adults often seem surprised by how hungry they get on an outdoor day. So don't forget to pack an extra snack or a slightly bigger lunch on days you plan to be outside. And don't forget your water bottle. Finally, despite all your best planning, things can still go awry. If your children have had not much had not had much opportunity to experience different ways of learning, there may be a great deal of excitement at first, and you may not initially see those improvements in behaviour and engagement that were reported at the start of the session. However, persevere, review your practice, make sure that you're not trying to teach exactly the same way outdoors as you do indoors, and be prepared to go with the flow when alternative learning opportunities present themselves in the middle of your carefully planned session. Stick with it and it will soon be your favourite part of the week or day and you'll be seeing the outdoor opportunities in all manner of material and learning objectives. For example, how about taking your history lessons outside while learning about the Stone Age? A much more significant proportion of ancient people's lives would have been spent outdoors than ours, so what better way to engage with the topic? Find natural resources for food and shelter, do some cave painting with Stone Age paint and homemade stick brushes, use clay and make pots, animal teas and artefacts, and plan a Stone Age feast. Meanwhile, we are aware that many of you will be focusing particularly on literacy and numeracy following children's absence from school during lockdown. However, this doesn't mean that you have to stay indoors. I would highly recommend visiting the website of Creative Star Learning for inspiration for your outdoor literacy and numeracy. It's run by education consultant Juliet Robertson, who writes the blog, I'm a teacher, get me outside here. And if you haven't already guessed, it specializes in learning and play outside. The website features a wealth of free resources and inspirational blog posts covering both activities and practicalities, and also provides access to another free resource provided by Sue Dixon of Thinking Child. Another education consultant with extensive experiences, a literacy specialist, advisory teacher and teacher trainer. Your outdoor space can be a wonderful source of inspiration for creative writing and poetry. Skills learnt or tasks undertaken outdoors can be converted to instruction text and the real life experiences the setting provides helps to develop vocabulary and comprehension. Juliet Robertson tells us the art of naming, describing and knowing about the world around us matters. You can learn the umpteen descriptions to describe the stem of a plant, but without observing these, it is much harder to memorize or to truly know and understand. One area of grounds development that we would really recommend would be to produce a map of your site and establish a set of marked locations indicated on the map and physically present on the ground in the form of posts or flats, ideally marked in more than one way, for example, with a number and a letter or a symbol. These locations, together with your map, will give you the opportunity to create trails and set up orienteering activities, which can be tailored to all manner of topics. For example, when working on traditional tales, we might place clues to a story around the site and challenge the children to identify and then retell the story from its parts. In this case, rhyming puzzles must be solved to identify the location where the story clues are to be found and the map used for navigation. As they move from place to place, the children discuss what the story could be, uh, no prizes for getting here, and build towards a retelling of the narrative and physical creation of the setting. The outdoors lends itself really well to aspects of shape, space and measure in numeracy, and you'll find all manner of ideas for activities in these areas. But there is plenty of potential for the use of number and problem solving in real life situations too. You could set up a maths trail for your older children that requires them to put their mathematical knowledge to real practical use. How much wood is required to replace the bench or gate or fence? How tall is that tree? Would it hit the building if it were to fall down? Could you measure exactly four litres using just a five litre and a three litre container? Or you could create a calculation trail where the addition, subtraction, multiplication or division at each point leads to a new destination, like the loop cards you might use in the classroom but with the opportunity to run from point to point rather than just shout out the answer. Again, there are so many possibilities to explore. However, 
Returning a third and final time to that question of why aren't we all doing outdoor learning all the time? We consider the other body oft quoted or at least implied as the reason it can't be done, Ofsted. Like HSE, Ofsted have produced documents to dispel the myth that their inspectors would not be happy to find children in a school inspection visit being taught outside the classroom. In 2008, they published a report called Learning Outside the Classroom, How Far Should You Go? in which they concluded, when planned and implemented well, learning outside the classroom contributed significantly to raising standards and improving pupils' personal, social and emotional development. And that learning outside the classroom was most successful than it, when it was an integral element of long-term curriculum planning and closely linked to classroom activities. The message from Ofsted is that inspectors want schools to shout about their learning outside the classroom activities, not do them as an extra that is shelved when the call from Ofsted comes. If you believe in what you're doing, demonstrate this to the inspectors. While this is all very positive, it still does not address the issue of how you might evidence learning when the work is not happening on paper. Here we can take guidance from our colleagues in early years provision and look at how we can use structured observations, sound recordings, video and photographs of the children's outdoor undertakings, annotated with the context and the learning objective to evidence their achievement. A date and title in the relevant book with a note that this session was held outdoors and a reference to the electronic file will go some way to assuage feelings that there will be nothing to show for all your hard work. When you're considering how Ofsted might view your provision, please remember that Ofsted does not advocate a particular method of teaching, nor do they require schools to provide evidence of learning in any specific format, or a particularly fre particular frequency or quantity of work in pupils' books or folders. However, Ofsted does want to see learners with positive attitudes towards learning, learners that reflect wisely, learn eagerly, behave with integrity and cooperate consistently well with others. A curriculum that extends beyond the academic, technical or vocational and provides for learners broader development, enabling them to, them to develop and discover their interests and talents. And it wants to see support for learners to develop their character, including their resilience, confidence and independence and help for them to know how to keep physically and mentally healthy, all of which are promoted, as we saw at the start of the session, by well-planned, good quality outdoor learning. Thank you, Liz and Alison. I'm going to hand over to Helena um, to, to um, put your questions to the panel. And um, just to note, our website, uh, our email address is on the slide there. Um, do send over any other inquiries or questions to us. We're happy to answer them. Hello. Um, so, Liz, the first question I've got is, um, do I need extra staff to help me without the learning and how many do I need? Okay, yes, yeah, that's a, a, a familiar question. Isn't it? Um, activities on school crowns, they shouldn't need additional staffing beyond that which you are using in the classroom or indeed for a PE lesson. Um, but when you venture off site or if you are doing slightly more risky activities, um, then obviously you'll need to comply with your settings policy on both who you use for additional su supervision and what ratio you use when you go off site. There is no hard and fast rule beyond the early years foundation stage as to exactly what those ratios should be. But OEAP does give some general guidance and we would suggest that you, you actually err on the side of a higher ratio of adults to children when it comes to more risky and more open-ended and um, unbounded activities. Um, but do make sure those adults are fully briefed on the purpose of the session and your expectation, expectations, both of them and the children, and that the children's not, activities not constrained by those sort of well-meaning but uninitiated adults. And, and those adults can be, um, according to your school policy, they can be um, parents and they don't always have to be uh, school staff. Um, so hopefully uh, that, that goes some way to answering that question. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Alison, uh, would you, what would you recommend for an entry level um, outdoor activity for first time students and as a teacher? Okay, so if you're a primary uh, teacher and you are thinking about, well, what's the basics I could do outside, I would always go for your living things and habitats kind of topic and start with mini bees hunting because it's quite the easiest you need equipment wise 
if you've got a few paintbrushes and a few tubs just to kind of brush a few mini beasts that you might find within your outdoor wild space into some kind of container the children can go away have a look what's out there you can talk about all the different habitats that you can see and how they vary in what they need as habitats for those mini beasts you don't really need to be an expert in mini beasts but there are lots of information online that will make you an expert so you know you can be your own David Attenborough and then for the national curriculum ticks, you can look at maybe classification, depending on what age the children are. Just put lots of boxes out to get the children to put their creatures in that box, depending on what vocabulary you've used. So maybe predator prey or first producer, or it's an insect because it's got six legs or it's got no legs or many legs, whatever age of verbal words that will you know, suit your age range. And then to go even further, maybe for your upper key stage two, you can start talking about energy transfer and different classification and even food chains, food webs. So my favorite is to get the kids to be those creatures and then use string between them all to kind of join the, all the children up as a whole big food web. And then even more exciting, try and look for those life cycles of those mini beasts. So yeah, that would be my starter for 10. Perfect. Um, and so Liz, got um, five five minutes or so left. So what would you do in bad weather, as that's quite a high risk in the UK? Absolutely, yes, it is always is. And I think the thing about well, the bad weather is, is there's a lot um, in attitude here and we need to be, I'm, I'm one of my um, high areas of concern is that we're, we're teaching children in some ways that, um, that weather is, is a problem, bad weather is in some, some way dangerous. So look at these lovely, happy, smiley faces wrapped up in their, their waterproof jackets. Um, we really need to encourage the right, the right type of clothing, as I said earlier. But we need to be presenting in our own attitude that we're, we're not scared of the weather and that the fact that we can go outside and we can stay safe and that it's not going to harm us in some way. And uh, getting beyond that, that fact that we don't want to actually uh, clear up the, the, um, the mess. So I think making sure we're not trying to take paper outside and we're trying to, to, to not work in the same way as we do indoors and, and just demonstrating positive attitude. I'm just going to pass back over to Emily as we've, we've now run out of time. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, um, Helena and Liz and Alison, and thank you for all the excellent questions. Um, I hope you're going to take away a few ideas from today's session. It may seem like a big step into the unknown, but it really doesn't need to be big or scary. There are absolutely loads of great resources and ready-made lessons plans out there. So just start small and enjoy. And we're going to wrap up with a few final thoughts, which all the sessions are highlighting through the Youth Climate Summit. So our vision, um, the Ernest Cook Trust vision is for an environmentally engaged society. And schools are such an important part of this. Um, there's been so much energy and hope throughout this conference and the next generation are no doubt in great hands with motivated teachers such as yourselves. So if you're up for it, the action we'd like you to take is this, to plan and deliver one session outside next term, just one, give it a go. And if you're not ready for that, read up on some of the links in this presentation, have a chat with colleagues at school, see if there's wider interest and don't feel like you need to do it alone. Finally, our ask for leaders is to give all children access to outdoor learning as part of their education. We know it has enormous benefits. We also know that funding can be a barrier. So I'm going to end this session with a plug for the Nature Premium campaign, which is calling on the government to fund regular um, nature experiences for every child to improve children's mental and physical well-being after lockdown and to demonstrate a positive investment in their future development as part of the green recovery. Please do take a look and sign the petition. They're almost at their target of 6,000 so let's see if we can help them out with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, enjoy uh, your outdoor learning adventure and do get in touch with us if we can help further. Thank you and goodbye from myself and the panel. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm.